So thank you very much for being here this morning. Welcome to our community leadership panel. We have Aaron, Vanessa, Diana, and Jacqueline here to join us. Would you welcome me, join me in welcoming them to our panel? We'll get started just right down the line. Um, just start off by introducing yourself and um, the organization that you work for. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My name is Jacqueline Rogers. I work at Parker Street Food and Furniture Bank, uh, where I am the coordinator of volunteers and events. Uh, so Parker Street is a food security organization, uh, primarily known for our food box program, uh, which serves over a thousand families a month. Uh, but we also offer many other services to assist low income families and individuals in the Halifax region. Uh, we provide furniture, clothing, housewares, and emergency funding, all free of charge to those in need. Um, so in my role, I recruit, train, place, and manage our growing team of over 100 volunteers. I arrange volunteer days and CSR days for local businesses, uh, and I help to facilitate co-op positions for high school students and service learning and experiential learning for university students. And I also help to plan fundraisers and our annual client service events as well. Beautiful. Thank you. Hi, my name is Erin Burbage. I'm the Director of Programs and Policy at Clean Foundation. We are an environmental charity that operates with offices in Prince Edward Island, Sydney, and in Dartmouth, which is where our home is. We were created in 1988, and we have a pretty broad mandate. We do work around environmental education and program design. So we do energy audits on homes and retrofit those homes to help folks save money and live more comfortably. We educate folks about electric vehicles and encourage the switch to lower carbon forms of transportation. We do a lot of education in schools, grade primary through to university on all different kinds of environmental topics. We have an internship program that helps place students with host organizations working in a broad variety of green economy jobs. And we also have coastal adaptation work, working to help mitigate the effects of sea level rise. Uh, I'm the director of programs and policy, so I do a lot of programs design, strategic development and planning, fundraising, uh, program evaluation, and some policy work related to all of those various topics we cover. I'm Vanessa Burns, and I actually own my own business, Vanessa Burns Consulting. I am a grant professional and a difference maker. So what does that mean? I help organizations navigate the world of free money in terms of grants. Everybody wants a grant, everybody wants that free money, but they're not really sure how to apply or how to put their best application forward. So I run a one-stop grant shop. So I do everything from making sure that uh, organizations are grant ready, that they understand the process. We research opportunities, we align opportunities, we write the application, we submit the application, and we wait for the result of the application. <laughs> and so I, uh, I kind of wear two hats. I do grant professional work, but I also do some fundraising consulting on the side as well, since I spent, uh, over 20 plus years in the nonprofit sector, working with various not-for-profit organizations. Um, I also sit on the board of the Association of Fundraising Professionals, the Grant Professionals Association, and I'm also co-chair of the Maritime Fundraising Conference. Follow that. Um, uh, my name is Diana McDonald. Uh, I am with the QE2 Foundation. And so for those of you who are not aware, we are not the IWK. So we are very different. Uh, we service adults. And so we are the largest hospital foundation in Atlantic Canada. And we're actually, we service all of the patient uh, care, equipment, research, and innovation through the QE2. And so for those of you also who are not aware, uh, the QE2 is actually 10 buildings. So a lot of people may think that it lives on Roby Street because that's where you see the emergency. Uh, that in fact is our Halifax Infirmary building, which is one of 10 buildings of the QE2. Uh, so we are made up of 10 different specialized centers and we are the specialized center for cancer care and heart health for Atlantic Canadians. Uh, currently we are in a $100 million capital campaign. We are halfway there. So we are at the $50 million mark. We have about seven years to go, uh, hoping we can complete that sooner, but we are a fundraising entity. 
And uh, my role within the QE2 Foundation is uh, Director of Events and Partnerships. So I lead BMO Ride for Cancer, which is actually Atlantic Canada's largest fundraising event. Um, this past year, we, we raised 2.1 million net. And um, we have many various corporate partnerships uh, as well that make up that portfolio. So many people think of us as the lottery home. We absolutely are the lottery home. That is us. Uh, but we do so much more than that. Uh, and it, it's really important for us to educate uh, as much as we can because um, we we do service those when when they need it and and in specialized care and and one last thing i'm just going to put out a plug um if anyone were to have a heart attack in nova scotia this is unknown um anyone were to have a heart attack in nova scotia they actually have to go to the qe2 uh where most people would think you know you go to your community hospital you get what you need you actually have to go to the qe2 so we are very much a regional center in addition to an atlantic canada center of excellence for cancer care perfect thank you all very much we would like to know how did you end up in community leadership is this what you've always wanted to do did you know this is where you wanted to be uh Diana, we'll start with you definitely not <laughs> <laughs> I um I always wanted to be in sport management, which I kind of still am doing with BMO Ride for Cancer, but uh no. I was attracted to the bright lights, events. I worked at the Halifax Metro Center, which is now known as the Scotia Bank Center, uh now for the first five years of my career in events. And I loved it, but I stumbled upon this opportunity to actually work in St. John um, for the St. John Regional Hospital Foundation there. And I fell in love with healthcare philanthropy, coincidentally. So people often say to me, why did you choose healthcare philanthropy? I didn't. It actually chose me. I think that's a key point. It actually chose you. I actually started uh, working or actually volunteering in the community sector when I was a co-op student at the Mount St. Vincent in the PR program. Uh, so we had to do, you know, different different terms, and I worked for a variety of organizations, but did some volunteer work with, um, you know, through the PR program, kind of in that field, and just, and yeah, it was, was kind of cool. I mean, it was a way to kind of give back. But then, I didn't think of it as being a profession. And I actually, my first job out of university was in special event management, which I did for five years, organized conferences and events for a lot of people in a lot of different places. And then I went into marketing. I had a bit of a varied career. I went into marketing with uh, Eastlink and did uh, launch. I'm going to date myself here. <laughs> launch digital cable and uh, high speed internet. So there you go. <laughs> Patty's waving at me. We need okay. that. <laughs> there you go. And then sort of I took some time off to raise a couple of kids and then went back, decided to go back into the workforce and was pulled into the nonprofit community sector with the Canadian Breast Cancer Foundation under their special event umbrella, which kind of fit what I was doing since graduating sort of from university. Did that for a few years and then sort of went to different organizations. I worked for CNIB, I worked for Heart and Stroke, I worked for Kidney, I think we're very single body part going, a Kidney, and then I, um, I also worked for for boys and girls clubs before the pandemic. So I did spend a lot of time in different positions with not-for-profits, but. The way I got to my own business was I was actually laid off because of COVID. Uh, our organization had to close its doors, so there had to be some difficult decisions, and I decided to go out on my own. I always had that entrepreneurial sort of drive and spirit and decided I was going to give it a try. My kids were older by then, so I kind of looked at what I did and did well, and it was obviously, I know the fundraising space, but I'm also a very good writer, plug for the PR program at the Mount. and decided to sort of start a business helping other organizations, you know, navigate on how to access funding. So I came into the sector having experienced it through volunteering. Um, I did step out for a while when I was working in it and I decided to sell <laughs> photocopiers and printers to see what the for-profit world was like and gross margins and profit this. And I was like, okay. And I did okay. I did actually I did okay. I did, I did very well. And then I decided to go back. So I've had a pretty of a, a much of a varied career, but it always pulls me back because it's a way of giving back. And you know, someone said to me when I was working in the sector, they said, you know, take a look at the mirror and know that the work you do every day saved my life. And that always stuck with me as someone who's been involved with the sector for a long time. So I'm I'm happy to still be involved. But from the other angle of running my own business and being able to work with a variety of different clients. So I, I came into it kind of 
you know, kind of kind of chose me too in a weird way. That seems to be a theme here. <laughs> Yeah, continuing in that vein, this is definitely not where I thought I would be. Um, I still don't know that I feel like I'm in a community leadership role. I feel like I'm in an impact organization because that's having tried a number of different approaches to trying to find my fit in life. That's what mattered for me. So once upon a time, I was in microbiology and biochemistry, loved it, got a research grant to do my master's. I'd be working with Ebola, which I'd wanted to do since I was 15 years old out in Winnipeg. Um, and then as I got into the end of my honors thesis, I was like, I don't, I want to know about these things. I don't want to do research science. Like I'm not, I'm not loving this. I don't get to interact with people. I spend a lot of time waiting for viruses to grow. You'd think they're epidemic. <laughs> You'd think they'd be easy to grow. No, my friends, they are not. Uh, and so it just wasn't really bringing the impact that I wanted. So I took a year off and I'm like, aha, law school. That's going to be it. That's going to be it. So I went to law school, loved it, loved learning about it, was fascinated by the subject matter, made a classic young person mistake, which is I didn't really think about what the job would be like. I just love the subject matter. Turns out it's business. And in Toronto, it's big business. It's 90 hour weeks. I didn't know why I was getting up in the morning when I did actually manage to sleep and I learned a ton. I loved it. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know why I'm working this hard. So I don't think this is it. So I paid off my student loans. Yay. And I came back to Nova Scotia and I decided that the thing that had been niggling in the back of my head was the world, the state of the world, the environment, and that I wanted to do something where I knew why I got up every morning. So I went and did my master's at Dal in resource and environmental management. And I started with Clean Foundation the day after I presented my final paper. And that was 11 years ago. So I think I finally nailed it. So plug to all of you out there, if your parents or guardians or influential people are like, pick something. Like, you know, sometimes you just have to keep going and find your right fit. So um, so my story is a little bit shorter because I just graduated uh, last year, uh, <laughs> but uh, I started um, my school at the foundation year program at University of King's College. Uh, <laughs> and then I switched over to Dal where I graduated with a sociology degree. Uh, I did kind of have an idea that I wanted to work in the not-for-profit sector. I always knew I wanted to do work that aligned with my own personal values, but definitely my career path was never clear until I started on it. Um, so yeah, I never really had an exact plan, uh, but I'm very happy to be where I am now. I learn uh, lots of different management skills and technical skills uh, in my position all the time, and I've been afforded a lot of opportunities um, uh, to grow and to, um, you know, do volunteer management in um yeah, I don't know if I would have received these same sort of opportunities if I was working in a larger company or in a for-profit context, so. It's definitely reassuring to hear that, like the path isn't linear, you don't have to choose a career right out of high school. Um, I mean, for me, it's reassuring, I'm sure some of you in the audience as well can find it reassuring. Um, it's interesting to hear all your different paths. Um, I'll go to you, Vanessa, just because that stuck out to me how many times you've changed around. Um, what do you like about this current field? Like, what have you found appealing about it that? Well, it, it's it's here? interesting. I've always worked, you know, with, you know, four organizations. And now that I work for myself, you know, within the sector, I like the variety. I like the variety of working with different organizations. So I'm wearing it, you know, a, a different hat from from the three other folks here on the panel today. So kind of giving a different perspective. You know, it's the the sector really is one. The, sometimes the pay is not great. The hours can be cruddy. However, you know, at the end of the day, you're making a difference. And I think for me as a person, that's something that's really important is that whole giving back. It's funny when I was in the in the PR program. Not working in the I, like, I was going to say the impact sector, like the impact sector, working in the impact sector was not viewed as a career option. I was told, you're gonna graduate, you're gonna come out, you're gonna be managers, you're gonna be running PR firms, doing this, doing that. Now you're not. Sorry, folks, hate to disappoint and you're, you. And you're gonna make 200 grand your yeah. first year. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but it, I think that, I think what with, with the sector, things are starting to change a little bit in terms of people are actually looking to the community sector as a career. I mean, there are, you know, 
fundraising degrees and you know all these things that are sort of coming coming around over the years but it's a sector that needs a lot of work too in terms of you know cleaning up and i'm not going to get into that in the sake of this panel we'll leave it at that um but you know there are there is work being done to sort of you know equalize the playing field in the sector but for me i personally like the fact that when I was working, you know, with organizations, you know, I got to go to work every day and, you know, to know that I was making a difference in someone's life or in an organization. So, and I get to help clients do that now. So best of both worlds, I guess. And Jacqueline, you're just coming out of a, a degree. You're just getting started. What are like the biggest challenges that you're facing starting in this career? Sorry. Um, well, in terms of challenges, I guess, um, in my field, particularly working in like the service of people, um, it can kind of feel like an uphill battle and like the work is never done sometimes, um, especially recently with inflation and the rising cost of food. Um, there's been a increase in demand for all of our services. Uh, in 2022, we had over 1,700 people register with our food bank for the first time. So these are people who probably never faced food insecurity before and probably never thought that they would. And they're in that position now. So, you know, sometimes you hear some sad stories and it can be hard to uh, confront those harsh realities on a regular basis. But at the same time, it's really great to be in a position where I can help because, uh, you know, I would still be listening to the news and know that that was happening anyway. So so to be working uh, in a role where I can actually make a tangible difference and see the impact of my work uh, directly is really um, rewarding. Amazing. I love it. Erin, um, would you do anything differently starting your career, your path? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I kind of, when I got, I saw that question, like I don't, I, one of the gifts, I'm an overthinker, but I actually don't tend to look back at my life and think I should do anything differently. It is what it is. And I, I like to think about harvesting the lessons from it, but in terms of, you know, being helpful to folks at the, the start of it today, I think recognizing that everything in life is a lesson you can learn and that you might be able to pull forward unexpectedly. I use my legal education and the things I learn in law daily in my job. I think you could learn use that kind of training anywhere. I sit on a couple of nonprofit boards and I'm forever learning by those folks. Um, so I think it's it's just recognizing that there is no end point. You are not going to land somewhere and that is the place that you are done, right? There is always room to grow and learn and everything you're doing is a part of that today, right? And then I think the other piece is maybe figuring out sooner that it's not so much the subject matter I should be thinking about in terms of my job, but how I feel about it. What is my workplace like? Do I like my colleagues? Do they like coming to work? That matters a huge amount, right? Like those things, I've, I've heard it said people quit bosses, not jobs. And I think without blaming the boss structure, I think it says a lot about people find that it's the people and the culture that often doesn't fit with them. And you can have a lot of passion for the subject matter. So think about how you feel at a workplace in addition to chasing that particular thing or things that's interesting. And if I'd figured that out sooner, I might have saved on some student loans somewhere along the way, <laughs> maybe. And Diana, for you as well, like what are your biggest like likes and dislikes and challenges working with uh, the QE2? This is gonna sound very cliche, but I actually don't have any dislikes. <laughs> I, I It is, and I recognize that. Um, it's why I've been with the organization 12 years, to be super honest, and I've spent the majority of my career there. Um, but I think it's that same sentiment that uh, these ladies are sharing, and that's that we make a difference in people's lives. So I, I realize that money, titles, status, that's all something that at some point in your life you crave or want, most of us. Um, and, and I'm guilty of that too, but you can have the best of both worlds if you find the right home. And so I've truly found the right home and I'm going to continue on this path as long as I feel like it's a home. And I think that's really important for me because I've actually get to live out my passion every day. So I don't feel like when I wake up, I'm going to work. When I wake up, I'm going to live my life. Um, which is really exciting. Again, probably sounds cliche, but it is it is very sincere. Do you wish you had done anything differently to get absolutely to where you're not? 
I'm very proud. I'm very proud of the career path and every, every obstacle that I faced has actually uh, gotten me further in my career because that adversity has just helped drive resilience. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> That's very heartwarming. Um, I know it's like the age old question now, I guess, but COVID, how has it impacted all of the businesses and how you manage the daily lives? Whoever wants to start, it's an age-old question for everyone. <laughs> well, I, as I said in my introduction, you know, I, I started my business because of yeah. COVID. I mean, I was the not-for-profit sector took a huge hit um, for some organizations, and I was forced to look in different ways to earn an income and decide to start my own business. So COVID, you know, has helped me do that. However, what COVID has done is it's opened the world. We're virtual. We can meet with people anywhere, you know. So I have clients not only here, I have clients, you know, across the country that never, ever would have happened. Honestly, I don't think before COVID. So having that virtual world, even, you know, from, you know, if you're working with an organization, you can do so much more sort of collaboration and you get to know what's going on in other parts of the country, other parts of the world. And you can take what you're learning and, you know, put it into your own organizations or even into, in my case, in my own business. So for me, the pandemic really boils down to that whole being able to connect with other people anywhere and it really it made the world actually a little bit smaller in in terms of um in terms of the results of that so yeah amazing Erin would you like to touch on it yeah I'm I mean I was a lawyer so shockingly I have two opinions on this I usually have more <laughs> I mean I think absolutely in terms of building new connections the the sort of option remote options have been fantastic it has opened up the opportunity for people in the city to communicate with folks in rural areas as long as they have decent internet right there's some challenges there what i have found though is the fact that people now tend to go virtual only you lose the nuance um climate change poverty like healthcare these are like what they call wicked problems these are challenging issues and there's an element of people to being together in a room not distracted by technology and that's where you build lasting bridges and you come up with creative solutions so i think we need to take all the good but we need to not lose the benefits of having that in-person contact and be strategic with it because i found when we started coming back to the office that was what I really realized had been missing uh, when everything was remote is those even the kitchen conversations where you can suddenly come up with the idea that you were missing because you just started gossiping about a television show. And 10 minutes <laughs> later, you're like, that's that's the grant we're going to write. Right. That's the pitch right there. It's pretty valuable. Can I add one thing? You made a really good point when you talked about, you know, in person and and virtual. I find I mean, I was I go to conferences and if you don't offer a hybrid model, both in person or virtual, you will be called out. So that, that that is something that we never really thought of before. And the whole accessibility piece for accessing things, you know, you have to have, I, I agree with you, you have to have both models when it is necessary. Absolutely good point. Um, so for me, I actually just started at Parker Street two years into the pandemic, so I can't really speak to uh, how it operated before 2020, uh, but I do know just from talking to my colleagues that uh, when when that happened, uh, it meant changing how we offer our services and quickly because uh, food security is an essential service and we have you know thousands of people who rely on, uh, on our food box program uh, to feed their families and such. So closing was never an option. Um, though for me, it has mostly meant uh, keeping up to date with uh, government protocols and uh, updating our volunteer policies accordingly, um, like in terms of masking uh, mandates and that sort of thing. Uh, and it's also definitely changed the way we have to plan our events. So um, we have to take a lot more uh, safety um, uh safety precautions and consider a lot more factors when uh, planning to make sure that our clients and staff and volunteers are uh, safe throughout the whole process. And especially because we're working with uh, vulnerable populations. So. so I kind of have a personal and professional opinion on this. Um, personally, uh, COVID has found me work-life balance. So I am in a role that could be an 80 hour week, 
a 40 hour week, a hundred hour week, just depending on what we're working on. And so that commute, I only live 12 kilometers from my home to the office, but that 45 minute to an hour commute uh, was actually uh, making me come home from work and working into the evening at nine, 10 o'clock on average. Now I can actually tell you, I fully work from home. Although we do have a hybrid model uh, at our office, I go into the office for brainstorm sessions and collaboration opportunities with my team. But we are so efficient from home uh, because that hour and a half or two hours that we're giving up in traffic, I'm now able to just get to what I need to get to and I can close up at six o'clock. So that is huge for me um, because I really did struggle uh, with, you know, trying to find success and being a young, young person in, in our industry uh, with that balance. So I'm very grateful for COVID in, in that regard. Um, it's also, I am an extreme extrovert. So <laughs> it has actually, you know, brought out a little bit of the introvert in me as well, um, which is great. So I, I'm, I'm really happy uh, with how COVID kind of presented itself for me personally. In that regard, professionally, um, we actually were lucky enough to be one of the nonprofits that didn't suffer during COVID because of our home lottery. And because people were sitting at home saying, what do I do today? I'll buy some tickets. <laughs> Fantastic. We, were, we didn't have to lay anybody off. Um, we actually had our biggest year ever. I think we raised 37 million in 2020, which is huge. Um, so for us, we didn't face that adversity. So I can't really speak to it um, outside of all of us as staff have really found efficiencies and we're working stronger um, and smarter together, I guess is a good way to put it. The pandemic's been a little yeah. bit of a blessing in a yeah, bad way. Hey? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now trying to keep up with that 37 million, that's impossible. <laughs> um, just because people are out now spending money, inflation, all of those things, you know, the ripple effect of COVID. And Jacqueline, I heard you say you do a lot with like the volunteers and everything. Um, what do you look for in a candidate when they're applying for these positions? Um, that's a good question. Um Honestly, there I would say having a experience in uh, volunteering or community work uh, definitely helps. But I would say it's the soft skills that really make someone stand out, like empathy, patience, and compassion. Because uh, in most cases, technical skills can be taught or learned. But in a leadership role, um, especially in a not-for-profit context, uh, it means a lot when other people can see that your heart is in it too. Like as cheesy as that sounds. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would say yeah the the right person is in it for the right reasons, I guess. Amazing. Diana, you work. I, totally <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with all that. I think you have to have core competencies. And uh, if you have good leaders, you will be successful. Um, what I personally look, look for is how well they can build a relationship. So I've hired many people uh, over the last 20 years. And if they can build a relationship, if a candidate can build a relationship with me in two minutes, that is extremely impressive to me. We are in the industry of relationships. That is what we do. And relationship management should be at the forefront of everything. So if you can speak, if you can go into the QE2 and speak to, um, you know, the janitorial staff, the same way you speak to a heart surgeon, I think that speaks volumes. And so, being able to be flexible in in your approach and also being empathetic, I think, is another huge thing in our industry. Um, because if you can relate with the people you're trying to help, then you will actually have more stake in the game. Agreeable. Oh, did you have a point? To I guess. Yeah. I mean, I've I've hired people over the years and also hired a lot of uh, co-op students as well. Be yourself. Uh, you know, a piece of paper is a piece of paper. You know, we all have resumes. We all put words on resumes. We try and make it look good. But really, I always love to see what's behind a piece of paper. It sounds kind of cliche. So, you know, when you come into an interview or you're, you're you know, you're presenting yourself, be, I mean, you look at me, this is what you get, right? I mean, so be yourself, be authentic. And, you know, some of the, the skills, writing, writing is huge in this business. You have to be able to 
you know, tell the story. Cause really this whole business is telling a story, you know, whether you're telling a story about the hospital, you're telling a story about climate change or, you know, food security, you have to be able to express yourself. So when I was, you know, working with, with students and, and, you know, hiring folks, it was really the writing piece, the authenticity. We always talk about being a team player and, you know, we all, we say we're team players. Some, some are, some aren't. You know, and the willingness, you know, to learn as well. So if someone's, you know, coming into a position, are they willing to, to learn? And and all, and and I and I love when people are also ask questions, and, you know, in interview. So if you're sitting in an interview, ask questions. You know, show interest. If you just kind of sit there going, yeah, okay, it's a job. No, you know, make sure that you're presenting yourself as yourself, and you're asking questions, and you're interested. And, and Patty's laughing at me. And, and you know, but but you 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 you're generally interested in the position, and and you know, and 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 have a reason why you want to work in this in this industry. Because as you know, as Diana, and we've all said, it's not an easy industry to work in. So you know, be prepared, be have that flexibility, but also you know, and and sort of go in. Well, you were saying that whole empathy piece and that relationship piece is so important. Can you have a conversation? I mean, so many of us are tied to these things today, and we can't talk to people. So if you know, in an interview is a really good example. If you can have a conversation and build a relationship with, you know, someone like myself or any of these folks at the table today, that's that's a really important skill you're going to have to take out into this into this profession for sure. Can I tell a quick story okay. after Aaron? Yeah. All the yeah. Time. Okay. Yeah. It's actually about a Mount St. Vincent Institute. Yeah. Whatever order you want to go into. <laughs> yeah, good one. I just wanted. To, I just wanted to say too. Don't be afraid to change careers or directions. But you need to, to the point of showing interest, explain it in a cover letter. So I am really excited when somebody applies without a relevant background because they can be bringing really different skill sets, right? The senior management team in, in my group, we have MBAs, we have a you know, certified professional accountant, I've got a professional trained recruiter, a teacher, I've got my background. Like, So you can come from anywhere, but you just need to compel people about why you're changing your career. And I see that so often, an interesting resume without an explanation of why there is that change. That's just my strategic advice, having reviewed a number of resumes and cover <laughs> letters. Don't be afraid to change, have the narrative, have the story, about why there's a lot of us who understand it you're still looking for your right fit i put stay-at-home mom on my resume for three and a half years yep. so don't yeah. be yeah. there you go it was a gap in my in my career and i explained yeah. it and it yeah. always came up and it was a good thing so i uh, a couple of years ago i had a knock at my office door uh, our receptionist debbie had let this very vibrant woman in um, without screening. <laughs> Anyhow, I get this knock at my office door and it's this young woman named Maria. She would be fine with me telling you her name. Um, she was a fourth year student, a PR here at the Mount. And she was fixated on working for the QE2 because it saved her stepdad's life. And so she, and she wanted to work in events. So she brought me a coffee Every Friday for six months, I hired her. She was the most impressive individual I have ever met in my entire life. And I can't tell you how much we grew over those weeks. So she would come in every Friday, even if I wasn't available and in a meeting, the coffee was on my desk. And so I would send her a note and we began to build this rapport and this relationship. And it was so impressive. I was like, where did you come from? Anyhow, fast forward a couple years later, she decided to follow her passion, um, which I was very excited for her about because her family is in law. And so she went to law school and she is a lawyer now. She works in Cape Breton. She's she's back in her roots and she's back home. Um, but she tells me all the time that this kind of move for her to work for the QE2 Foundation really was the stepping stone for her entire career, even though she did leave us and went into a totally different industry industry because she learned so much and actually she spent so many years giving back and she saw her work changing people's lives. And so she thanked me for that. And I just, it's, it's mind blowing how things kind of come full circle, but I wanted to share that with you because that tactic worked and I would do it again. And I would give that person a chance again, if they did that, because it's resilience and that's really, really impressive to me. So just kind of wanted to share that. It's a unique pro. It's a unique way of presenting yourself, for sure. She's a, she's a go getter. Mm. Yeah, it is unique, and I love that you shared that because I find like most days, 
we're told to connect on LinkedIn, connect virtually. But it's nice to have that antidote of like in person still because I find, I don't know, we're a little bit more shy to approach in person now. Absolutely. So. And something else that I love is I've received thank you cards in the mail mm-hmm. from people after interviewing them in the mail. And that's really impressive because we don't get mail anymore. So all of a sudden you're like, look how pretty this is. I'm going to put this out. And it's just, it's really impressive because it it took effort to go and do that. And anyone can sit behind, you know, a LinkedIn, which I love LinkedIn. Don't get me wrong. I'm in there. I'm on there every day. And I've recruited people through there. Um, But that those touch points are are so important. But you made a good point. Thank you. Always send out thank you emails or cards, whatever you're comfortable with after an interview, because that will stand out. Because actually in this profession, you'll be sending out a lot Mm -hmm. of thank yous. So good practice. Yeah. And I guess I just, I'd add for the benefit of the introverts in the room for whom Maria is like a superhero of Marvel proportions. Another way to do it, if you're not quite uh, of that mindset, reaching out to somebody who has a position that you're interested in and just saying, I'd love to, I'd love to meet you for a coffee and just understand how you are and where you got there. I have a ton of time for people doing that because people helped me out with that early in my career. So don't be afraid to send an email and know that people are busy and your email might land not on a great day a follow-up a week or two later but like most people are actually very happy to share their experiences and their knowledge it feels good to feel like you might be able to save somebody some mistakes or or give them some encouragement so a one-on-one coffee is another great way to build a relationship and maybe that turns into a job it has once in a while sometimes it actually just gives you the next link i've introduced people to their next employer just by saying hey i think you're interested in this i have a colleague doing that so like that is another really fantastic mechanism that shows like a lot of dedication and that just might feel a bit more comfortable to those of us for whom Maria is <laughs> amazing, but oh my goodness, not, not something I could manage. That was, yeah, sort of my next go like point was cold calling, cold emailing, acceptable. I know for yesterday, business and tourism, it was big because hospitality, it's very okay. You just have to have a hook. So if you're going to reach out on LinkedIn, make sure there's a hook in there. If it's just a hi, nice to meet you, can we collect? It's like, why? Tell me about yourself. What's the hook? Like, what, why do you want to collect? Um, because we, we often get a lot of these requests and a lot of inboxes on in LinkedIn. Just differentiate yourself from others. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I mean, don't, don't, connect with someone and just hit the connect button and leave it at that. It, the note is really, really important. I'll always make time to have a conversation with someone. Listen, we all start it somewhere. Yeah. I get it. Uh, we There was one time we were on that side of the table listening to people up here doing the same thing. So I'm always open to having conversations. It really helps to understand why you want to have a conversation, you know, what you're looking to get out of the conversation. You know, that's sort of, that's a good point. But yeah, if you're connecting it's really important to send to send that note and be clear about why you want to have a have a connection and your email or request will probably be will most likely be more more answered than that's a terrible sentence. And it's really <laughs> impressive <laughs> when you ask for advice. So like I still use that as a tactic to meet with people. So if there's a CEO or a VP uh, at another corporate entity that I'm looking to engage, I will ask them for coffee for advice instead of just saying I'm coming to ask you for money. Um, (laughs) Because all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I want to give you advice. Absolutely. Let's meet. So we come, we have the little advice chat. And then when you get into it and it actually, it, it, it's a, it's a fantastic tactic that, that has worked and people want to share. So the more you ask, the, the more engaged they, they will be. And for the record, I don't drink coffee. I drink tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to note for later. <laughs> I feel like that sort of led into my next question of advice for people trying to get into the field. Is there any more tangible, tangible, there we go, tangible, practical advice that you would give anyone entering the field? I would say, don't be afraid to challenge. Like, you know, don't be, you're there to learn. And it's always, you know, just because something's being done a certain way, 
I have no problem if someone says, you know, have we ever looked at doing something this way? I know it's a little uncomfortable to sort of get into that zone. It, it shows you have those leadership abilities. And I think by sort of challenging maybe some older practices within organizations will set you apart from, from some other folks. And always be willing to learn, ask questions. And, you know, as we all said, the place you, well, like Diana, I mean, the place you start may not be the place where you end up and you may, well, I know, but you know, I'm here there 12 years, <laughs> but, you know, be open to change. You know, this profession and this industry, it's, I mean, most people in the chair, you know, the community sector, I think the average is like two, two and a half years in a position. So you're, you're going to move around, be open to that and be open to enjoy the experience, you know, ask questions, challenge and learn. Those are my, my points. Jacqueline, would you have any advice for new and upcoming students? Um, yeah, well, lots of advice already, um, <laughs> like even for myself just starting uh, in my career. Uh, but I would say uh, look for work in a field or with an organization that you're genuinely interested in or uh, you believe in their mission because especially starting off when you're not making a lot of money, you kind of need that motivating factor to um, kind of drive you and make you want to uh, excel in your role. Uh, which I would also say, uh, which has already been mentioned, uh, yeah, urge people to um, not look at the starting position or entry level position you might get at first, but uh, look at the organization as a whole, because once you're in that role, you can kind of make it your own and uh, grow in that uh, role too. And so, uh, yeah, sometimes you just have to get your foot in the door and then prove yourself and uh, that goes a long way. I actually used to wrap my president, my president's wife's Christmas presents um, when I was an assistant at the Halifax Metro Center 17 years ago uh, because I came in as a marketing and events assistant through a co-op, by the way. So that is something I did want to talk about. When you're picking your co-op, make sure you actually pick at least one organization that you could see yourself growing with um, and focus there because that's that is actually what I did and I gave it a hundred and two hundred percent when I was there because I wanted to stay there and while they didn't hire me right away they remembered me and they hired me six months later and I was there for six more years after that. So when you're thinking about your co-ops, most of you, I think, are doing them. Um, think about, like, really thoughtfully look at organizations that you could see yourself growing with and don't just tick a box um, because you really, there there could be potential there. You, that could be your future. You, you really don't know. Um, and once you get through that co-op, reevaluate. Maybe it's not where you want to be. Maybe it actually taught you a lot and you're like, okay, I need a new place for my next um, co-op and maybe I don't even want to be a nonprofit anymore. Um, and then I just wanted to also touch on a misconception. There, you do have to work hard when you come into this industry. Um, you know, people say that nonprofit doesn't pay well. That's not 100% accurate all the time. I think when you're coming in at any organization, you're coming in at an entry level, you're not walking into a manager role and you have to work your way up. And it is the exact same way with nonprofit as, as it would be at Stuart McKelvey or, or the Scotiabank Center or wherever you kind of land. So don't let that discourage you because I can tell you that, um, you know, if you work really hard and this is your passion, you, you will see the benefits and rewards down the road. You just have to work hard to get there. I was going to mention too, volunteering, that goes a long way and that can actually get you into organizations to kind of get a feel of what it would be like to work in that sort of, you know, line of work. And the other thing too is, as I mentioned, I mentioned a couple of, you know, professional organizations that I'm a member of that are always open to having people join, you know, events. For example, the Association of Fundraising Professionals it has a local chapter. They're very active. They often have like um, professional development sessions. They have the, you know, the Maritime Fundraising Conference, always looking for volunteers. Great way to meet other folks that are in, you know, the community sector. So yeah, take some time. And, and if you're interested in, in following this kind of line of work, then do some volunteer work, see what it's like, see if it's where you want to be. And, you know, organizations always love a helping hand. Parker Street over here would love to have you on board probably. <laughs> so volunteering, sure. volunteering and, and, and CQOs and professional associations as well.
Do you have anything to add? If not, I'll open the floor to questions. Yeah, I'll open the floor to questions online, in person, if anybody has anything. <laughs> I have a microphone I'll give you. That makes people feel fancy. <laughs> okay, I have to bring you the microphone. It's for online. It's for the people online. I need to get my steps in too. I have a question for the wonderful panel. As women in leadership roles, finding the balance between family, career. How did you find it? I'll be, I'm gonna be honest. I was a sing, well, single mom, I raised two kids and I burnt out. I'm not gonna hide behind, you know, the face here. I burnt out in the profession. I finally found balance, honestly, when I started my own business. Um, you know, I, I can work how much I want to work. It's um, it's it's difficult for me to find. It was difficult for me to find that balance when I was working in an organization. I was trying to raise two kids, and as Diana said, I mean, sometimes, it, and I was kind of on the event side as well. And some, you know, it was 80, 90 hour weeks raising two kids, and it's not easy to do. And once I sort of had that burnout happen, I realized I'm not going back there. And you may think, well, you started your own business, you have to hustle all the time. I, I, I work what I want to work, and my business is, is doing well on my own terms. So be kind to yourself. And I wish I was kinder to myself and not realizing that I had to push myself so much to the point that I couldn't push myself anymore. So, yeah, I've been down that road. It's, it's hard. It's definitely hard, but I think as you know, back to what you said in terms of the pandemic, it it has allowed us to sort of focus on more of that balance. But as women, I mean, and a single mom with two kids, it was it's trying to be all place at the same time. It wasn't easy. It's not easy. I I'm child free. It's a choice I've made. Um, and I, I just want to kind of underscore that like family is not the only thing in life you need to make time for that. That's critical. I cannot imagine how hard a job parenting is. Uh, I'm an auntie and that's like fantastic and rewarding, but then I get to give them back. So my God, kudos <laughs> to parents out there. Right. But I had a mentor when I started early on who was also child free and she said, if you let only family obligations and daycare, if that's the only reason you decide you're allowed to leave work early, for example, what kind of a life is that for yourself? Whether or not you have children, whether you don't, what do you need to be a fulfilled and balanced person? Like find your boundaries and draw them and then keep those boundaries, whatever they are, right? Whether or not it's your other volunteer life, whether or not you love playing music and you're in a band after hours, like any job, in a capitalist society can get really consuming. Even in the nonprofit sector, right? We operate in the larger world. You can lose yourself in any job if you don't set your boundaries. So regardless of what your important priorities are, set them and protect them and don't be apologetic about that. And I think women in particular tend to fall into apologizing for setting and maintaining our boundaries. And so whatever you are, whatever gender, whatever identity, it's critical. So I'm kind of still working on that um, to be incredibly vulnerable. Um, I don't, I am child free as well. That is a decision my husband and I made, um, but I do have many other outlets in life and I volunteer quite a bit for a lot of other organizations and family is very important to me, just not my own spawn. <laughs> um, so, but I, I'm not there. I, I, I can definitely tell you I have not found that ultimate balance yet. I am still working on it. And um, I don't know if I ever will, to be super honest. And, and I think that might be okay for me because my career is my passion. So I, and I am just kind of living that right now and, and we'll, we'll see how it continues to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a one-year-old dog, which uh, keeps me pretty busy. Uh, <laughs> No, but I, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I 
get up early and have that time for myself. And uh, I really do agree with making time for your own hobbies because uh, that can give you a sense of purpose beyond your job. And, uh, you know, you kind of need to have that sense of fulfillment outside of your work too. And I think that's important and finding that balance has definitely uh, helped me be confident in my job too, because I know that there's other things that give me value, I guess, besides just what I'm doing for my nine to five job, you know. So. <laughs> All very important points. Do we have anything, any questions? I have a question for you guys. Okay. Um, is is nonprofit any like an industry any of you can see yourselves going into not based on our discussion today like even just <laughs> even just coming <laughs> into the discussion is like is it is it on your radar i guess is the question yes yes <laughs> well the sometimes electives no i'm just kidding <laughs> so it is it is something yeah okay Awesome. Which is so interesting because yeah. as, as I said, you know, I was, was sitting in these classrooms, you know, in <clears throat> early nineties and that was not the norm, not for profit was never mentioned. It was not even a viable profession or place to sort of work. So it's, um, I love it. I think it's, it's kind of neat to see the tables, the tables are, are turning. And I think I'll add, it was a, a stereotype I had certainly about what I thought the nonprofit sector was. I mean, I was in the side, like every profession, every sector you're in kind of gives itself airs. Uh, and I think what I thought about the nonprofit sector was they had the biggest hearts and the most dedication and the most passion, but maybe not operating at the same caliber. I don't know where or how I built this impression, but I just want to name it, right? I certainly had it. Um, I've had the benefit. I didn't even mention my brief stint in government. Um, you know, I've been around, but I, I have had the benefit of working in so many different places and like not just my colleagues at my organization, but the colleagues I meet across the board working at all different kinds of nonprofit associations. They are there because of their passion to a person. They could all be in the corporate sector. They could have gone into research like they absolutely all have impressive impressive ability and I'm so consistently inspired by the people I work with. So in terms of finding a place where you can learn from talented people and being operating with people at like very, very high caliber, that was something that I think maybe honestly kept me from thinking about the nonprofit sector early on because of this stereotype I had about it, which has been demonstrably not true at all at any point in my career. People often ask me, like, why do you work in nonprofit? You're in events. Like, you could go do anything. You could live anywhere. Um, and I think it goes back, to, it comes back to, at the end of the day, I know I'm making a difference in someone's life, um, even if it's one person that day. Generally, it's much more than that because we see the direct impact that we have. I don't know if I could go into an industry where, you know, I'm working with just like stage set up for Keith Urban. Yes, it sounds amazing. Yes, you get to meet him. Awesome. Cool. But when you're going to bed that night, like what's what satisfaction do you really have? Like when you wake up the next day, you're really that excited to go like, be that production manager on stage, not probably as much as you are when you're meeting cancer patients who the treatment that you just funded saved their life. It's very, very different. And I, I think that at the end of the day, if the passion, uh, if your passion aligns with um, giving back, I highly encourage you to get into this industry because you will be rewarded every day and uh, you'll never work a day in your life because that, that's actually how I feel. Actually, when I left the world of selling printers and photocopiers, <laughs> I went and I went back into the community sector. Someone said to me, oh, you're taking a step backwards. So think about that for a minute. I've never looked back, but in their mind, it was like, oh, you're going from a for profit doing this, this, this. Oh, you're a not for profit, you know, broke and this, 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 which really wasn't the case. However, you know, think about that. I was taking a step backwards but for those that raise your hand no 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 no. you're taking a step forwards and and pursue that passion i did receive a question online um it says a lot of people nowadays including me are lost in their journey and don't know their passion yet they're just trying to survive by doing temporary work 
Any advice for them? I think that's valid. I mean, I think it takes time to find your passion. I did not know what my passion, well, actually, no, I knew what my passion was at every point. Turns out I'm evolving. And what made me feel like I wanted to wake up in the morning was evolving. And it didn't really start to land until I was honestly in my late 20s. So sometimes you're you're a late bloomer, which is fine. So don't don't try too hard to find your passion and feel like if you don't have it yet. And you know what? Some people won't ever have one passion or your passion might be the band that you're in and you want a job that is fulfilling and meaningful and you play music at night. So I think there's also like a lot of different ways you can be happy. Making ends meet is important, but every opportunity you have, what about your current gig do you like? What do you hate? Like interrogate that. What skills are you learning that are intriguing? Which ones don't you like, right? So again, there's always opportunities to try and figure out at least where you wanna go next, right? It's really hard to aim at career, and like aiming at passion is a big gap, but you can find yourself in the right place if you just kind of follow your instinct to the next step, right? It's a lot less intimidating to just try and make it to that next point that feels logical and then follow that along. And some of us have never had a plan. We've kind of responded to what's happened in life and that's worked out really well so far as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna echo that. I did not have a plan. <laughs> Um, 25 years old, uh, I had, I had started my career at the Halifax Metro Cellar at the time, but uh, prior to that, oh my gosh, I worked at the movie theaters and old Navy and like all kinds of retail positions that I thought, I don't want to do that for the rest of my life, obviously. Um, but the skills that I gained there, I actually didn't realize would be valuable down the road. Um, I thought, oh, I'm, you know, you graduate, you just walk into your dream job, not a chance. Um, and, and to be honest, I think your passion finds you, um, because mine, mine certainly did. I'm 53 years old and you can tell by the varied career that, that I kind of talked about it out loud, the different places I've worked. I mean, definitely what Diana said, everything I've done every volunteer position, every, you know, work environment I've been in has actually led me to where I am today. Was it all good? No, I had three layoffs or three in my, in my career. I mean, so, I mean, it's, it's, but every one of those layoffs in the non, in the nonprofit sector has brought me to where I am today. And so I'm still trying to find my passion sometimes. I mean, I mean, on my personal side, I'm a rock and an ice climber. So I know that passion. You talk to me about climbing, I'm all over it, right? But professionally, it's taken me up to the age of 53 to start finding the passion. And the passion for me is being able to work for myself and being able to work with a variety of different organizations. That's my passion but that took me a long time to find. So everything I did over the years has led me to start discovering that passion. So you may not find that tomorrow and don't be discouraged. Embrace it all, that's all I can say. A lot of introspective work, definitely important. Is there anything else anymore? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fancy. Um, hi. So I was, I just want to ask that, like, you guys are like leaders, like over here. So what are the best ways to develop your leadership skills? Like to speak publicly or any, like, like, you know, in that way? Self-awareness. Honestly, like I was, I always saw myself as someone that wanted to be a leader. Well, like I want to be a CEO. I do. That, that is, that is on my path. That is what I want. Um, but I didn't know how to get there. And I had no idea. I thought, oh, you just have to have a team and then you have to raise a lot of money and then that's going to make you a CEO. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> so, you know, I was hungry for success and I found myself along the way being so defined by finding success that I didn't realize how people were experiencing me. And so they saw me as this like, not, I'm not going to say monster, that's not the right word, but they saw me as this kind of, I don't even know um, what the word is, but I just wanted it so badly and I wanted to take everybody along with me, which I did. But at the same time, I didn't realize how I was making others feel. 
And so it took me a couple of years of a deep self-awareness and like diving into like who I am, realize that like empathy is huge, trying to understand others and making sure that like you can see from through their lens is so important in a leadership role because how do you inspire, mobilize your team if you can't understand where they're coming from? Um, so empathy is massive. It's off the charts. Emotional intelligence is really, really, really important. And unfortunately, it's something that I didn't realize till later in my career. So I would say the last five years, I've been really focusing in on learning more about myself, self-awareness, how I'm making others feel in my presence, and then also teaching that to others, uh, my own team, so that they can do the same. I, I, I think that's a, a really strong leadership skill. And I think, you know, leaders that don't have it, you can, you can pick them out. And so, um, that's kind of, that's kind of my advice on that one. I always say there's leaders and there's bosses. Yeah. So I look back over all the folks that I've worked with over the past, and I can tell you, you know, who's, who's a boss and who's a leader. And to Diana's point, the bosses were the ones that said, okay, you have to be in at nine, do this, do that. You know, there's no flexibility. They wouldn't listen. It was their way or the highway where the leaders had that empathy. You know, they, they would listen to different sides. So, I mean, I could say, yes, I am a CEO of my own company now. I don't have any employees. It's me and my dog, uh, you know, <laughs> but you know, I, when I'm working with folks, it's, you know, how, how did I feel when I was working with a leader? And so the, the feelings that I had from that in terms of being listened to, being heard, being understood, being able to, as I said, challenge things and not be you know reprimanded for that, that's all great leadership quality. So when I'm working with folks, that's how I work with my clients. And I you know, it's not my way or the highway with clients. I mean, we always have, you know, open, it, it can't be, I mean, it's, we always have open discussions. So, you know, there are definitely bosses and there are definitely leaders. And I will completely echo what Diana said in terms of that empathy and being aware of other people's feelings and the world that they're living in right now. Very important. And I guess I I those skills incredibly um, plus one. Um, I think the other piece is that there's a lot of different styles of leadership, and as you go through life, again, like think about I have what I call anti mentors, people I've worked with in positions of leadership, and I think, what didn't I like about how they did what they did? How can I turn that into a lesson? Right? Part of it is it keeps me out of the mindset of complaining constantly. There's a bit of venting, but there's also, what about that didn't work and why? Do I, do I have that? Is that part of my toolkit? Um, how do I maybe try and move away from that now that I've had this chance to see outside myself and see how that might get perceived? But also there's, I think, stereotypes of what leaders are in terms of like the corporate sector. There's quiet leadership. There's leadership by example. You need a style that's authentic to you and that takes time to build. But whatever it is, it's the ability to bring your team with you. And, and you need to flex that with different team members, right? So if you've got the introverts, you need to be aware that they might need a different space to reflect. They want a challenge, but they might not challenge at a big table of people. So you need to talk to them one on one, right? So you need to kind of also learn your team and what you need to support them and have some different styles that are all still part of you, but have a toolkit that lets you work with different people, including those that challenge you, those that you would never choose to have coffee with one on one. They're on your team. They're valuable contributors. You want to build bridges and work with all of those people equally well, not just the ones that are kind of like most like you. Those are the easiest people mm -hmm. to lead. It's leading the people. And those are the ones who bring a lot of value in because they check your own biases as a leader. And if you build that confidence for them to be able to speak up and and say, I don't, I don't know that that makes sense, right? Like that's a really successful team. A good leader will hire people that challenge them and that they can learn from. A boss will hire people that they can be a boss over. So that's, that's, I like what you said about that. That is, that is so true. You guys are actually living in a really um, unique time where you can almost interview the company you want to work for. We didn't get to do that. Um, you, you can go in corporate social responsibility is at the top of every organization's priorities right now. 
and that's great for nonprofit uh, as well. But you you can really pick and choose the organization and the culture that you want to attach yourself to, and that's that's pretty amazing. I wish we had that opportunity. We do now, um, you know. But uh, as as young professionals coming into your fields and your industries, I I recommend you do that interview them as much as they're interviewing you because it needs to be a fit for you as much as much as it needs to be a fit for them and inclusion is very important um and that's something we're focused on as an organization too hi um my question kind of surrounds like the idea of self-confidence and confidence in like entering the professional world did you people find um, did you guys find that you came out with like a strong sense of I can do this or were you a little bit more nervous entering your first placements and jobs? I'm going to say your I faked it till I made it. <laughs> to be super honest. So I walked in with all the confidence and was like, I've got this and I didn't. No one knew that. Um, and I eventually learned and I, that confidence became authentic. And I, I, I don't think it like, I don't think people looked at me and they were like, that's a fake confidence by any means. Um, but it was definitely like an internal kind of battle that I was trying to show everyone that I had it, even though I didn't, but that kind of adversity pushed me, um, to, to having the confidence. And now I do. I'll be transparent. I may sit up here today and look like I got it all together. I'm really confident. I have imposter syndrome quite a bit of time. Even today, you know, doing my own my own business, I'll go, gee, I'm not good enough to do that. But I know that I am, right? So, you know, even someone like you know, of us sitting up here, that I'm sure we all have some kind of imposter syndrome. So it's something that you build. And, you know, the more opportunities you get to put yourself into different situations, It'll, it'll, it'll happen. I mean, we're not, we're not, you know, some of us are introverts. We're obviously the extrovert at the table <laughs> over here. Um, you know, some of us are shy. Some of us are outgoing. You'll always have that voice in your head. And I'm, and I'm not going to sit here and say that's going to go away. Cause as I say, it has never gone away. I don't think for any Like I still got nervous coming here. Yeah, I mean, so like it's, I. it's just, and I speak in front of people all the time. So like it, that's, that's going to live with you. I think forever yeah 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 but I mean as Diana said yes I my, my very first job out of out of <laughs> university was I was hired with a small event management company I did some event planning you know with some volunteer things but this was planning conferences for like thousand people this that the other thing and it was a little bit of fake it till you make it um but I was also it was a learning experience too so you know don't be afraid you know we're, we're all going to make mistakes you know, I don't, you know, yet the word fail doesn't really exist in my vocabulary. It's learning. You know, we make mistakes. We learn from the mistakes. And honestly, at the end of the day, I like to use this quote is everything is figure outable. That's Marie Forley. Like, everything is figure outable. You will find a way and you will build that confidence. So have faith in yourself. And I guess I'd say for me, one thing I've, I've realized, I get unhappy when I am not challenged. Mm -hmm. I, I joke in my job because I've had five different titles. I've managed like 25 plus different programs, all different kinds of skill sets. Um, at the point where I start to really figure out what I'm doing, my job description changes. And that's, that's actually, I really liked it. That's why I'm at the same organization because I've never actually gotten to a point where that, that kind of I feel so comfortable in what I'm doing, I will get bored. So I've realized I do this to myself. I keep seeking out that challenge, which means that confidence, the confidence, the only confidence I have now is that I can generally figure things out and I will muddle my way through. I am never confident on any new assignment. I still lie awake at night. I still overthink it, but I get a little bit more confident that if I, every time I push myself into the deep end of the pool, so to speak, or that, you know, somebody else pushes me off that I'm like probably going to figure out how to swim and I'm probably going to enjoy that challenge. So that's, that's sort of, I think where you end up for a lot of us. I was at a spin class the other day and I heard a quote. The instructor said, when you feel nervous, it means you're going to do something great. 
So like Diana, believe it or not, I was a little nervous coming here today, and this has been a fantastic experience. So remember that if you're feeling nervous, you're going to be doing something great. And I would just add as well, um, you don't actually know what you're capable of doing mm -hmm. until you've tried it. And you might fail or make a mistake the first time, but then you learn from that and then you do better next time. Mm -hmm. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you very much. I want to, I think we've come to an end of time here. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to our panel. You guys want to join me in thanking them? Definitely been a lot of insights and insightful wisdom and I think I learned a lot. I hopefully everyone else here is as well. Um, I just want to remind the students, it is a Learning Passport eligible event. Get your, your bonus points before the end of term. Um, just complete the survey that's on Moodle within 48 hours and you're good to go. Other than that, thank you very much. And feel free to reach out. I'm always happy to have a conversation with folks, so don't be shy. <laughs>